So let me give you guys a very quick overview into what this series is about. So this is called the Lost Memories series, and this was brainstormed with Yasmin um, and Iman. And our initial you know, event today was going to be on the myth of Mayahua, which is a Mexican uh, culture. But then Yasmin had to go, and so we're going to postpone that. And quickly, Iman and I brainstormed and said, well, why not talk about Kali? Because it has some of those similar vibes. The objective of this series is to, in an experimental and exploratory way, create a sacred space. So this is something that, you know, Iman, myself, we kind of want to do, but we don't exactly know how to do it well. <laughs> and so you're all kind of like collaborators on this and getting feedback. If any of you want to collaborate and make your own things, we can kind of work together on that. And so this is our first approach into trying to do this. Maybe it won't be fully successful, but it's a good <laughs> first baby step. Um, and it's a space where we share our cultures and explore spiritual healing and then have some really deep discussions with beautiful, deep, interesting people. So today, I'll just quickly talk about the spirit of Kali. Initially, when you see these images, it may evoke, I don't know, perhaps a little bit of fear. Maybe you feel a bit overwhelmed by it. Maybe it even seems kind of evil because, look, there's all this blood and decapitated heads. And it's a very, you know, somewhat fearsome image that is over here. So I'm going to kind of explore perhaps what could this mean. But before I do, the very important disclaimer here is that I'm not an expert. So, you know, the way you should view me is like I'm like a child. I'm doing a book report. I may get some things correct. I may get some things wrong. Some of you actually know, you know, the mythology of Gali way better than I do. So, you know, at the end we'll have a time, a space for those of you that know it better to correct anything I've said incorrectly and then add your layer onto it. And I think it's okay for me to do that as long as I'm clear about the fact that I'm not a master. This is just my interpretation and what I take away from it. So if you do a search on Gali online, you'll see that she's a goddess. And already I kind of feel like it's important to talk about the, what exactly Hinduism is, maybe to people who are outside of it. So Hinduism is a complex religion. It has many different overlapping perspectives. It can be both polytheistic and monotheistic. And just to give you like a little taste of that, even those that have a polytheistic view that there are multiple gods and goddesses, I think pretty much all of them would say that all of these gods and goddesses are emanating from this singular source of energy. And so then there is this like monotheistic vibe along with it. And then there are a whole bunch of people that believe that all of these gods and goddesses are symbolic representations of deep philosophical ideas, but may not exist in reality. So there are all of these different perspectives, interpretations that are out there. And I tend to take the perspective where these are symbolic representations. And so what I'll share is my symbolic viewpoint of what exactly is it that these depictions of Kali are representing, or at least what they evoke within me. Now, before I get into actually talking about the symbolism of, you know, the goddess Kali, I'll talk a little bit about tantric philosophy. And the reason I do this is because I feel like it gives interesting perspectives, interesting flavors into understanding what that image is. And I ran into this philosophy just maybe three years ago. You know, I had just started my journey into romance and I spent a whole year just doing literature review and interviewing people. And in my basement, I found this book. And this was a book written by my mother's PhD advisor. And he was a scholar of Dantic philosophy. And it was just really kind of interesting to learn about it. So I'm just going to go over one or two things. I made a whole YouTube video on this, if you guys are interested. It's very good. Yep, thank you. This, just, just doing a book report on this. And this doesn't represent all of Dantic philosophy. It's just one person's perspective. So before even getting on to that, I'll talk about you know, this, this, I would say, almost mainstream Hinduism. It was the Hinduism that I grew up in. I'll describe that very quickly, and then I'll contrast it to Tantric philosophy. So growing up, you know, the things that my mother and my grandmother and other people taught me is that one of the goals of kind of, you could say, mainstream Hinduism is merging with divinity or oneness or feeling universal love. And all of this is based on the, ide uh, the ideology that there is one truth, like one reality, one energy, consciousness, whatever you want to call it, and everything that we see in the world is an illusion. And that illusion, they sometimes call it maya, is not necessarily bad. I mean, you can be part of the karmic cycles of cause and effect within that illusion. But when you get ready to want to escape these cycles and be liberated and merge with what this oneness is, one of the methods that they tell you that 
you may want to use is detachment. The idea of detaching from all the earthly pleasures that consume our minds so that then we can truly see what is oneness, what is God, what is energy, whatever you want to call it. And so this was a really important point, and my grandmother would tell me about it. So you're detaching from earthly possessions, from physical per, uh, possessions, but also from things that bring you pleasure, like really good food or sex or any of those things, because all of these things are attachments that bring us deeper into this, these loops of cause and effect. And my grandmother would even tell me, like, you know, when death happens, be sad, but don't be sad for too long. Don't linger in it, because death is just an illusion. At the end of the day, we are all manifestations of energy, and energy is neither created nor destroyed. It's only transformed. And so when a human dies, they're just being transformed, but that energy is always there. So these would be the things that my grandmother would teach me, my mother, you know, different people. Now, the, the tantric philosophy is just slightly different. And some people would say that, you know, the tantric philosophy is within Hinduism. Others would say it's a parallel path or a different path. Other people would say it's interwoven. So it, it's, you know, some people would find it very taboo and, and hard to talk about. But what's kind of interesting is that at least from the book report that I did, that one book, which may not represent all of tantric philosophy, but what this scholar was saying was that the goal is exactly the same, which is to ultimately merge with divinity, oneness, to be able to emanate this feeling of universal love. And what's kind of interesting is that the tantric philosophy has a slightly different perception of what is reality and what is illusion. And from there, the, all of the manifestations come out that make it very different from everything else that we know maybe in standard Hinduism. So their basic assumption that's different is that everything in the world is a manifestation of divinity and God, mm -hmm. and therefore nothing is really an illusion in that sense. And it's a really kind of interesting idea. You might be like, well, what, then what are the consequences of this one small uh, assumption? And the idea here is then you're not trying to detach from earthly pleasures, but rather you're using your earthly pleasures and sublimating them, you're converting them, you're transforming them so that you can reach a state of oneness. And again, I, I don't know which one's right, detachment or sublimation. They're really interesting ideas. Maybe it's different people resonate with different things. In theory then, if that's the case, you know, you can use ideas that are typically taboo, like anger, like sex, or even drugs, to reach a state of oneness, in theory, okay? What's interesting, because like if you do a search on Tantra on the internet, all you get is like a lot of sex stuff. Um, and you know, <laughs> and nothing, nothing specifically wrong with that, but I think when you look at the internet, what they miss, at least from this one book report that I did, is that the underlying goal is that you're not supposed to be doing it hedonistically just for pleasure. None of these things. The objective is that if you're going to use anger, or rage, or sex, or anything, it's in a devotional practice. And the reason I'll use sex as an example is just because in this book report, that's what they, they use as an example. But the idea is that if you're going to use you know, sex as a way to reach oneness, you, you go through it as a prayer. It's, it's almost like a religious prayer. You learn deep love, and then in theory, that sense of oneness and deep love, you're able to generalize to the world. And the final step is actually transcending and going beyond that. You don't need this anymore. You don't need anger or sex or drugs or anything. You can reach that state just like that. Um, hey, what's up? You can come on now. Oh, hey. Um, okay, so that's like kind of like the deep idea that they're saying here. You want to be able to go beyond that, that you know, connection. So now, what could this imagery mean over here? And so this is the way that I interpret it. The ultimate goal is to become one with, with whatever you consider God. Again, just, it could just be energy. It could be this feeling of deep love that's immersing or emanating from you. If that's the goal, then anything that gets in the way, you could say, is like a demon. And typically, if you sit down to meditate, just like we were right now, well, what happens? Your mind creates distractions. It creates loops. And one of the ideas could be is that either you go and say, okay, through detachment, I'll disconnect from all of these things that make me loop my mind, and those loops will become faded. And now I can become one with that. Or, the second option is, you could, in theory, use rage, use anger, and be able to destroy these looping thoughts so that you become, you enter into the state of absolute, singular, unwavering focus. Now again, the danger in this is, because I've met a lot of people who can get pretty deep in meditation, they're not always the best people, and not always the most balanced. So it's, I feel like it's kind of a fallacy that you say meditation always leads you to goodness. It doesn't, you know, in my experience. So the final step always, 
in my opinion, from, from my little book report here, and I could be wrong, is that you want to be able to transcend this state of anger. Once you feel and taste what singular focus looks like, then you transcend it, and then you feel this, this universal love. And that's pretty much it. Um, I'll give you one practical example, because when I did the book report, I was like, where are the practical examples? I don't, I don't really see it. So in my own journey you know, of, of romance, you know, I, at the age of 40, I went on it. I had a one-year beautiful you know, relationship. And then I got my heart broken, and it was done in the most masterful, beautiful, artistic way. She did a great job with it, but no matter how masterful a breakup is, sometimes it hurts a lot. And for like five, six months, I couldn't sleep, and I had all of these like really intense emotions. Some of those emotions were very negative. And then, as we were talking about a little bit, I went to ecstatic dance. And usually if I go into a dance situation, I'm very awkward, I don't know what to do. But in this situation, I was so full of emotion, all I wanted to do was like rip and tear the fabric of space and time. And I just closed my eyes, I went into the zone, and it was like I was in an altered state of mind for like an hour and a half. And I was able to use that anger to get into this really deep state. And as I began to do that more and more, my hurt turned into gratitude. And now I, you know, I meet my former girlfriend once a month because it's a beautiful relationship as friends. Um, but the idea there was that I was able to maybe convert that into something beautiful. I don't know if that's a tantric philosophy, I don't know if that represents Kali, but that's kind of my interpretation and my perspective. Okay, so that was my introduction into that, and now Iman will give hers, and I'll turn this thing off.